Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and this caught my eye. This is one of those tweets that will set the crypto police off. Crypto Bull says XRP price targets based on trend lines. Look at his, let me blow that up. Based on his trend lines, $10, $27, $800, I'll take any three of those. I don't know anything about trend lines, but I like the chart. Link2 has uh, added, I don't know if they just added, but I know these I didn't see them on before, but they have Circle. They've got, I think, Cerebrus, Uphold, and Kraken that they've just added to the Link2 platform, and they are one of my sponsors. So it's up there right now if you go check it out. Uh, Brad Combs, look at this. Digital Chamber. Chamber. We're thrilled to announce Bradcom's Digital Perspectives, a prominent, he's a prominent crypto YouTuber. As a speaker at DC Blockchain Summit 2024, folks, that means he's going to be on the stage. In fact, I'll, well, let's look at it. Bradley's known for his insightful analysis and thought-provoking discussions on the latest crypto trends. Folks, this is what you call the adults in the room. Let's look at the adults that Brad Combs is going to be speaking with. You're going to have a lot of them. There's Perry Ann Boring from the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, this guy's from the Te Texas Blockchain Count Council. Representative Warren Davidson will be there. Representative Mike Flood will be there. Who else is going to be there? Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is going to be there. There's Brad Combs. There's Caitlin Long. There's Cynthia, Senator Cynthia Loomis. There's... Uh, Pat, Representative Patrick McHenry, Scott Milker, there's Caroline Pham from the CFTC. Oh, Hester Pierce is going to be there from the SEC. Um, anybody else that jumps out here? Nobody else. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of big big timers there, and somehow Brad Combs makes it on. All right, check it out. What do you think is happening right now with Bitcoin? But, you know, usually I do not like to predict price, but I think we're at a very, very good time. Of course, there's some consolidation. There's a saying, I guess, in the space that, hey, if you're not ready for my 20% drops, you're certainly not ready for my 600% increases. Um, but overall, what we're seeing is some consolidation. The ETFs just launched. We've seen tremendous run up in a very short period of time. Um, a little bit of pullback is happening. But, you know, all of the macro climate remains extremely bullish for Bitcoin. Uh, primarily due to what people know about the long term, which is what, what we care about most at, at BitGo, uh, which yeah. is long term macro, it looks like we're still going to be very solid with having a static supply of Bitcoin being something that you can count on that doesn't get eroded. And of course, you know, fiat currencies continuing to do massive changes with debt and deficits and no sign of change for that, that front. Bitcoin, we've got the halving coming up as well, potentially another underpinning of price. But who's been getting into these ETFs? Have we been able to monitor flows, Mike? We have a little bit. Uh, actually, so far, I think it's been mostly uh, the smaller ticket sizes. So remember, institution... Okay, I think we've seen enough of that. Uh, then I wanted to show you this. You know, we had that bridge collapse uh, in... Uh, it's called the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Maryland. And it collapsed, and there's a lot of conspiracy stuff going around on this. You're not... You got to talk real quietly because we're not allowed to talk about conspiracy or wild speculation on on YouTube or on Twitter or on X because the um, Twitter police, the crypto Gestapo, they could be around any corner. They could be listening. They could have their feelers out. So I'm going to say this really softly. This is a black swan event. Black swans normally come out of the world of finance, not military. The standard operating procedure for all U.S. ports, harbors, and bays that transit commerce and military activities are supposed to maintain an incredible level of discipline, rigor, and awareness for those very type of events to occur ever. Yet here we are. 
there are harbor masters for every single one of the, these transit points in America that are in charge of assuring the safety of navigation. Navigation start there. That's all I can say, folks. Now, this is great. Metal Law Man, funniest part of the SEC's damages brief in Ripple has to be the 29 pages of tweets that hurt their feelings after Judge Torres issued her summary judgment ruling. Check to see whether your tweet was included in the filing. Now, Meta Lawman is the adult in the room, and here's a clip from Thinking uh, Crypto, Tony, Tony's uh, Thinking Crypto, where the adult in the room steps up to tell all of the people at the SEC or former SEC chairman or, or commissioners, think Joseph Grunfest, one of the most respective. I want you to think of Joseph Grunfest while you're listening to this. We have got to have these people resign and get new leadership. And so far, I'm just not seeing that happen. The judge concluded that this was not a case of a few bad apples, but rather there was a pervasive culture of organizational bad faith. And the problem is the commission itself. Who's giving the orders and all of that to cut corners like this and, and do this sort of thing? I don't know, but it's really, really troubling because these people are supposed to be working for us. They're supposed to serve the people, and what they're doing is lying to destroy Americans. What I would really like to see is former senior SEC officials coming forward right now and saying what needs to happen are resignations at the top. Senior officials who care about the integrity of the SEC should step forward and say this is really, really Wrong. Yeah, where are they? What happened to that United States of America? And here's my observations after scrolling through the SEC motion that they filed and seeing all the tweets of people out here in the XRP Army. Hey, everybody. Um, I, I just wanted to, to go through this real quick just to illustrate just how corrupt and how awful that a federal agency of the United States who is, who's, whose number one job is to protect investors, their number one job. Now, I want you to think about this as I scroll down. They, the, in order in their, this is their motion, what's it called here? It's called a motion, this is James Flan. It's called a motion um, for remedies and entry of final judgment against Ripple. Now, everybody, in order to try to justify and rationalize and make the judge mad somehow at the $2 billion and, and, and get $2 billion from Ripple, this SEC, who has never even acknowledged the 75,000 holders of XRP, who they let for over eight years, they let these, these people, innocent people, go out and buy this. They never said a word, and then they dropped a lawsuit after eight years knowing and having been warned that they would damage these XRP investors by doing so. Jay Clayton was warned by Grunfest. They were all warned. They were even warned of the national security implications. And they did it anyway. But now, <clears throat> now, once they have, have finally ignored all of those investors, ignored how they've hurt them, not even acknowledged them, now, they're going to acknowledge those people's tweets because they think that they can somehow leverage these average people who are just sick and tired of being sick and tired of government corruption. Now they're going to acknowledge these people that, and show you that they've been studying these people and watching these people, but it wasn't to protect them. It was to figure out an angle of attack against Ripple to try to leverage the 75,000 people to attack the company instead of reaching out to those 75,000 people who have literally formed an army, army to do what the SEC is supposed to do, which is to protect themselves because the agency no longer does it. The agency protects itself. The agency acts more as an organized crime unit to file enforcement actions in order to hold companies over a barrel while they let Chinese invested companies continue to flourish. This should disturb everyone because these are Americans right here. These are Americans 
It's some non-Americans, but mostly Americans right here that are being attacked by the very government agency that is supposed to protect them. True story, it's the fact Jack Brian Costello gets it. How is the SEC's nefarious attack on crypto and hiding Chinese crimes related? And why, is, why does it matter to every American? Because it's a glaring sign of our government that our government has stopped even pretending to serve the average American, opting instead to protect elite donors who flourish in existing banking system and are wired into China's financial success. It's utterly gross what has transpired at the SEC under the uniparty leadership of both Clayton and Gensler. I think that is key right there. It's both of them. It's both parties. Mickle at XRP Mickle makes a great point here. In the eyes of the SEC, providing evidence means showing the judge that even a sitting congressman, Warren Davidson, thinks their actions have been egregious and unreasonable. Can someone explain to me in what world this would help the SEC? Well, XRP Mickle, the problem is you're assuming that these guys are smart and they're not just political hacks that have been put here to do what they're told to do. Here's Warren Davidson. It's time to fire Gary Gensler, restructure the SEC. You got that right. Here's Smoke, who's been over the target on a lot of stuff lately. With all that in mind, um, how do we deal with this issue of exchange rates and interoperability? How do we get these digital currencies to really just talk to each other? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I think when we talk about interoperability, we can, we can see it at least in three different levels. So the first level is how we manage domestic interoperability. So how we generate this digital currency solution and make this speak with the other things that are out there uh, in a little bit in, in the idea of generating a platform so that everyone can connect to that platform and take externalities that we can get out of there. The second level is how we manage cross-border transactions, even within the same currency. And that presents a, a certain level of challenges there. But when we talk about cross-currency and cross-border, then we face a, a completely difficult, a difficult and different environment. And we can see three dimensions here. One is the technical dimension, so how we manage to get a system that speaks in a certain cryptographic language to speak with another that speaks another slightly different language. So that is one uh, level of complexity. We need to get the technologies to speak to each other. The messaging element is fundamental. The second dimension, which is much more complicated to solve, so that one, the first one was the easy one, okay? And uh, there is a lot of money that is being put in terms of, of trying to solve these technical issues of, of interoperability. Now, the second one is more complicated. It has to do with liquidity. So imagine that you have a pair of currencies for which there is not a, a complementary demand. You need to go and uh, search for a third-party uh, currency in order to make this, uh, this settlement actually happen. And this really complicates things. Uh, so we need to put pieces of technology that can uh, make more efficiency this use of liquidity so that more transactions can be settled. The third dimension, which is even more difficult than the previous one, is how do we manage to get homogeneity in terms of the policy requirements on different countries. And this becomes even more complicated when we think about, for example, AML CFT and principles-based policies, and when we think about risk-based policies. We can code things that are very clearly stated, you know, but when we're talking about principles-based regulation, this thing becomes really complicated, especially in an environment, uh, as Tom said, in which uh, 110 nations might have 110 different ways of, of looking at this. So, so we need work in these three dimensions, technology, liquidity, and also, uh, and more importantly, probably in the policy side of things. Think about AML CFT, but also Okay, um, I'm going to skip that. I don't want to make this too long. Here's Cowboy Crypto, who is the official cowboy of the Digital Asset Investor channel. Ripple's institutional sales involved more than 1,700 relevant contracts. Page 24, footnote. And this, uh, folks, I've always thought that these could, some of these could be option contracts. That, that word that you're not allowed to say on Crypto X. Um, pre-allocated option contracts where people are pre-allocated XRP via options but we can't say more on that or we could get in trouble US government indicts crypto exchange KuCoin on criminal charges now remember KuCoin is is I think where are they located Hong Kong well if they can go after them why haven't they gone after tether that's the question well, I mean I think we know the answer now in DAIXRP.com, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk, look, there's, there's, there's somebody out there who says we've got 
an infiltrator in our midst. I'm going to throw a guess at who they're pointing to because we don't have a name yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, uh, uh, the reading between the lines. I'm going to tell you who I think that they're pointing at. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family. Here we go. It's time to go see who is the secret agent man that they're referring to. Here we go.